This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Vein by Chrétien de Troyes. Translated by W. W. Comfort. Section 6 Just then the damsel came out of her room, with her graceful body and her face so fair and pleasing to look upon. She was very simple and sad and quiet as she came, for there was no end to the grief she felt. She walked with her head bowed to the ground. And her mother, too, came in from an adjoining room, for the gentleman had sent for them to meet his guest. They entered with their mantles wrapped around them to conceal their tears, and he bid them throw back their mantles and hold up their heads, saying, You ought not to hesitate to obey my behests, for God in good fortune has given us here a very well-born gentleman, who assures me that he will fight against the giant. Delay no longer now to throw yourselves at his feet. May God never let me see that, my lord of Aid hastens to exclaim. Surely it would not be proper under any circumstances for the sister and the niece of my lord Gawain to prostrate themselves at my feet. May God defend me from ever giving place to such pride as to let them fall at my feet. Indeed, I should never forget the shame which I should feel, but I should be very glad if they would take comfort until to-morrow, when they may see whether God will consent to aid them. I have no other request to make, except that the giant may come in such good time that I be not compelled to break my engagement elsewhere, for I would not fail for anything to be present to-morrow noon at the greatest business I could ever undertake." Thus he is unwilling to reassure them completely, for he fears that the giant may not come early enough to allow him to reach in time the damsel who is imprisoned in the chapel. Nevertheless, he promises them enough to arouse good hope in them. They all alike join in thanking him, for they place great confidence in his prowess, and they think he must be a very good man, when they see the lion by his side as confident as a lamb would be. They take comfort and rejoice because of the hope they stake on him, and they indulge their grief no more. When the time came, they led him off to bed in a brightly lighted room. Both the damsel and her mother escorted him, for they prized him dearly, and would have done so a hundred thousand times more had they been informed of his prowess and courtesy. He and the lion together lay down there and took their rest. The others dared not sleep in the room, but they closed the door so tight that they could not come out until the next day at dawn. When the room was thrown open, he got up and heard mass, and then, because of the promise he had made, he waited until the hour of prime. Then in the hearing of all, he summoned the lord of the town and said, My lord, I have no more time to wait, but must ask your permission to leave at once. I cannot tarry longer here but believe truly that I would gladly and willingly stay here yet a while for the sake of the nephews and the niece of my beloved Lord Gawain, if I did not have a great business on hand, and if it were not so far away. At this the damsel's blood quivered and boiled with fear, as well as the ladies and the lords. They were so afraid he would go away that they were on the point of humbling themselves and casting themselves at his feet, when they recalled that he would not approve or permit their action. Then the Lord makes him an offer of all he will take of his lands or wealth, if only he will wait a little longer. And he replied, God forbid that ever I should take anything of yours. Then the damsel, who is in dismay, begins to weep aloud and beseeches him to stay. Like one distracted and prey to dread, she begs him by the glorious Queen of Heaven and of the angels, and by the Lord, not to go, but to wait a little while. And then, too, for her uncle's sake, whom he says he knows and loves and esteems. Then his heart is touched with deep pity when he hears her adjuring him in the name of him who he loves the most, and by the mistress of heaven, and by the Lord, who is the very honey and sweet saviour of pity. Filled with anguish he heaved a sigh, for were the kingdom of Tarsus at stake, he would not see her burn to whom he had pledged his aid. If he could not reach her in time, he would be unable to endure his life, or would live on without his wits. On the other hand, the kindness of his friend, my lord Gawain, 
only increased his distress. His heart almost bursts in half at the thought that he cannot delay. Nevertheless, he does not stir, but delays and waits so long that the giant came suddenly, bringing with him the knights, and hanging from his neck he carried a big square stake with a pointed end, and with this he frequently spurred them on. For their part, they had no clothing on that was worth a straw, except some soiled and filthy shirts, and their feet and hands were bound with cords, as they came riding upon four limping jades, which were weak and thin and miserable. As they came riding along beside a wood, a dwarf, who was puffed up like a toad, had tied the horses' tails together, and walked beside them, beating them remorselessly with a four-knotted scourge until they bled, thinking thereby to be doing something wonderful. Thus they were brought along in shame by the giant and the dwarf. Stopping in the plain in front of the city gate, the giant shouts out to the noble lord that he will kill his son unless he delivers to him his daughter, whom he will surrender to his vile fellows to become their sport. For he no longer loves her nor esteems her, that he should deign to abase himself to her. She shall be constantly beset by a thousand lousy and ragged knaves, vacant wretches and scullery boys, who all shall lay hands on her. The worthy man is well nigh beside himself when he hears how his daughter will be made a bawd, or else, before his very eyes, his four sons will be put to a speedy death. His agony is like that of one who would rather be dead than alive. Again and again he bemoans his fate, and weeps aloud and sighs. Then my frank and gentle Lord of Vane thus began to speak to him. Sire, very vile and impudent is that giant who vaunts himself out there. But may God never grant that he should have your daughter in his power. He despises her and insults her openly. It would be too great a calamity if so lovely a creature of such high birth were handed over to become the sport of boys. Give me now my arms and horse, have the drawbridge lowered, and let me pass. One or the other must be cast down, either I or he, I know not which. If I could only humiliate the cruel wretch who is thus oppressing you, so that he would release your sons, and should come and make amends for the insulting words he has spoken to you, then I would commend you to God, and go about my business. Then they go to get his horse, and hand over to him his arms, striving so expeditiously that they soon have him quite equipped. They delayed as little as they could in arming him. When his equipment was complete, there remained nothing but to lower the bridge and let him go. They lowered it for him, and he went out. But the lion would by no means stay behind. All those who were left behind commended the knight to the saviour, for they fear exceedingly lest their devilish enemy who already had slain so many good men on the same field before their eyes, would do the same with him. So they prayed God to defend him from death, and return him to them safe and sound, and that he may give him strength to slay the giant. Each one softly prays to God in accordance with his wish, and the giant fiercely came at him, and with threatening words thus spake to him, By my eyes, the man who sent thee here surely had no love for thee. No better way could he have taken to avenge himself on thee. He has chosen well his vengeance for whatever wrong thou hast done to him. But the other, feeling not, replies, Thou treatest of what matters not. Now do thy best, and I'll do mine. Idle parley wearies me. Thereupon my lord Yvain, who was anxious to depart, rides at him. He goes to strike him on the breast, which was protected by a bear's skin and the giant runs at him with his stake raised in air. My lord of Vane deals him such a blow upon the chest that he thrusts through the skin and wets the tip of his lance in his body's blood by way of sauce. And the giant belabors him with the stake and makes him bend beneath the blows. My lord of Vane then draws the sword with which he knew how to deal fierce blows. He found the giant unprotected, for he trusted in his strength so much that he disdained to arm himself. And he who had drawn his blade gave him such a slash with the cutting edge, and not with the flat side, that he cut from his cheek a slice fit to roast. Then the other in turn gave him such a blow with the stake 
that made him sing in a heap upon his horse's neck. Thereupon the lion bristles up, ready to lend his master aid, and leaps up in anger and strength, and strikes and tears like so much bark the heavy bearskin the giant wore, and he tore away beneath the skin a large piece of his thigh, together with the nerves and flesh. The giant escaped his clutches, roaring and bellowing like a bull, for the lion had badly wounded him. Then, raising his stake in both hands, he thought to strike him, but missed his aim, when the lion leapt backward, so he missed his blow, and fell exhausted beside my lord of aim but without either of them touching the other. Then my lord Yvain took aim and landed two blows on him. Before he could recover himself, he had severed with the edge of his sword the giant's shoulder from his body. With the next blow, he ran the whole blade of his sword through his liver beneath his chest. The giant falls in death's embrace. And if a great oak tree should fall, I think it would make no greater noise than the giant made when he tumbled down. All those who were on the wall would fain have witnessed such a blow. Then it became evident who was the most fleet of foot, for all ran to see the game, just like hounds which have followed the beast until they finally come up with him. So men and women in rivalry ran forward without delay, to where the giant lay face downward. The daughter comes running, and her mother too, and the four brothers rejoice after the woes they have endured. As for my lord Yvain, they are very sure that they cannot detain him for any reason they might allege, but they beseech him to return and stay to enjoy himself, as soon as he shall have completed the business which calls him away. And he replies that he cannot promise them anything, for as yet he cannot guess whether it will fare well or ill with him. But thus much did he say to his host, that he wished that his four sons and his daughter should take the dwarf, and go to my lord Gawain when they hear of his return, and should tell and relate to him how he has conducted himself. For kind actions are of no use if you are not willing that they be known. And they reply, It is not right that such kindness as this should be kept hid. We shall do whatever you desire. But tell us what we can say when we come before him. Whose praises can we speak when we know not what your name may be? And he answers them, when you come before him, you may say thus much, that I told you the knight with the lion was my name. And at the same time, I must beg you to tell him from me that, if he does not recognize who I am, yet he knows me well, and I know him. Now I must be gone from here, and the thing which most alarms me is that I may too long have tarried here, for before the hour of noon be passed, I shall have plenty to do elsewhere if indeed I can arrive there in time. Then, without further delay, he starts. But first his host begged him insistently that he would take with him his four sons, for there was none of them who would not strive to serve him, if he would allow it. But it did not please or suit him that any one should accompany him, so he left the place to them, and went away alone. As soon as he starts, riding as fast as his steed can carry him, he heads towards the chapel. The path was good and straight, and he knew well how to keep the road. But before he could reach the chapel, the damsel had been dragged out, and the pyre prepared upon which she was to be placed. Clad only in a shift, she was held bound before the fire by those who wrongly attributed to her an intention she had never had. My lord Yvain arrived, and, seeing her beside the fire into which she was about to be cast, he was naturally incensed. He would be neither courteous nor sensible who had any doubt about that fact. So it is true that he was much incensed. But he cherishes within himself the hope that God and the right will be on his side. In such helpers he confides, nor does he scorn his lion's aid. Rushing quickly towards the crowd, he shouts, Let the damsel be, you wicked folk, having committed no crime. It is not right that she should be cast upon a pyre or into a furnace. And they draw off on either side, leaving a passageway for him. But he yearns to see with his own eyes her whom his heart beholds in whatever place she may be. His eyes seek her until he finds her, while he subdues and holds in check his heart, 
just as one holds in check with a strong curb a horse that pulls. Nevertheless, he gladly gazes at her and sighs the while. But he does not sigh so openly that his action is detected. Rather does he stifle his sighs, though with difficulty. And he is seized with pity at hearing, seeing, and perceiving the grief of the poor ladies who cried, Ah, oh God, how hast thou forgotten us? How desolate we shall now remain when we lose so kind a friend, who gave us such counsel and such aid and interceded for us at court. It was she who prompted Madame to clothe us with her clothes of bear. Henceforth the situation will change, for there will be no one to speak for us. Cursed be he who is the cause of our loss, for we shall fare badly in all this. There will be no one to utter such advice as this. My lady, give this bare mantle, this cloak, and this garment to such and such an honest dame. Truly such charity will be well employed, for she is in very dire need of them. No such words as these shall be uttered henceforth. For there is no one else who is frank and courteous, but every one solicits for himself rather than for some one else, even though he have no need. Thus they were bemoaning their fate, and my lord Yvain, who was in their midst, heard their complaints, which were neither groundless nor assumed. He saw Lunette on her knees and stripped to her shift, having already made confession and besought God's mercy for her sins. Then he who had loved her deeply once came to her and raised her up, saying, My damsel, where are those who blame and accuse you? Upon the spot, unless they refuse, battle will be offered them. And she, who had neither seen nor looked at him before, said, Sire, you come from God in this time of my great need. The men who falsely accuse me are already before me here. If you had been a little later, I should soon have been reduced to fuel and ashes. You have come here in my defense, and may God give you the power to accomplish it, in proportion as I am guiltless of the accusation which is made against me. The seneschal and his two brothers heard these words. Ah, they exclaimed, Woman, cherry of uttering truth, but generous with lies. He indeed is mad who for thy words assumes so great a task. The knight must be simple-minded who has come here to die for thee, for he is alone, and there are three of us. My advice to him is that he turn back before any harm shall come to him. Then he replies, as one impatient to begin, Whoever is afraid, let him run away. I am not so afraid of your three shields that I should go off defeated without a blow. I should be indeed discourteous if, while yet unscathed and in perfect case, I should leave the place and field to you. Never, so long as I am alive and sound, will I run away before such threats. But I advise thee to set free the damsel whom thou hast unjustly accused. For she tells me, and I believe her word, and she has assured me upon the salvation of her soul, that she never committed or spoke or conceived any treason against her mistress. I believe implicitly what she has told me, and will defend her as best I can, for I consider the righteousness of her cause to be in my favor. For, if the truth be known, God always sides with the righteous cause, for God and the right are one, and if they are both upon my side, then I have better company and better aid than thou. Then the other responds imprudently, that he may make every effort that pleases him and is convenient to do him injury, provided that his lion shall not do him harm. And he replies that he never brought the lion to champion his cause, nor does he wish any but himself to take a hand. But if the lion attacks him, let him defend himself against him as best he can, for concerning him he will give no guarantee. Then the other answers, Whatever thou mayst say, unless thou now warn thy lion and make him stand quietly to one side, there is no use of thy longer staying here, but be gone at once, and so shalt thou be wise. For throughout this country every one is aware how this girl betrayed her lady, and it is right that she receive her due reward in fire and flame. May the Holy Spirit forbid, says he who knows the truth. May God not let me stir from here until I have delivered her. Then he tells the lion to withdraw, and to lie down quietly, and he does so obediently. 
The lion now withdrew, and the parley and quarrel being ended between the two, they all took their distance for the charge. The three together spurred toward him, and he went to meet them at a walk. He did not wish to be overturned or hurt at this first encounter. So he let them split their lances, while keeping his entire, making for them a target of his shield, whereon each one broke his lance. Then he galloped off until he was separated them by the space of an acre. But he soon returned to the business in hand, having no desire to delay. On his coming up the second time, he reached the seneschal before his two brothers, and breaking his lance upon his body, he carried him to earth in spite of himself, and he gave him such a powerful blow that for a long while he lay stunned, incapable of doing him any harm. And then the other two came at him with their swords bared, and both deal him great blows, but they received still heavier blows from him. For a single one of the blows he deals is more than a match for two of theirs. Thus he defends himself so well that they have no advantage over him, until the seneschal gets up and does his best to injure him. In which attempt the others join, until they begin to press him and get the upper hand. Then the lion, who is looking on, delays no longer to lend him aid, for it seems to him that he needs it now. And all the ladies who are devoted to the damsel beseech God repeatedly and pray to him earnestly not to allow the death or the defeat of him who has entered the fray on her account. The ladies, having no other weapons, thus assist him with their prayers. And the lion brings him such effective aid that at his first attack he strikes so fiercely the seneschal, who is now on his feet, that he makes the meshes fly from the hauberk like straw, and he drags him down with such violence that he tears the soft flesh from his shoulder and all down his side. He strips whatever he touches, so that the entrails lie exposed. The other two avenge this blow. Now they are all even on the field. The seneschal is marked for death, as he turns and welters in the red stream of warm blood pouring from his body. The lion attacks the others, for my lord of Vane is quite unable, though he did his best by beating or by threatening him, to drive him back. But the lion doubtless feels confident that his master does not dislike his aid, but rather loves him the more for it. So he fiercely attacks them, until they have reason to complain of his blows, and they wound him in turn and use him badly. When my lord of Vane sees his lion wounded, his heart is wroth within his breast, and rightly so, but he makes such efforts to avenge him, and presses them so hard, that he completely reduces them. They no longer resist him, but surrender to him at discretion, because of the lion's help, who is now in great distress, for he was wounded everywhere, and had good cause to be in pain. For his part, my lord of Vane was by no means in a healthy state, for his body bore many a wound. But he is not so anxious about himself as about his lion, which is in distress. Now he has delivered the damsel exactly in accordance with his wish, and the lady has very willingly dismissed the grudge that she bore her. And those men were burned upon the pyre which had been kindled for the damsel's death. For it is right and just that he who has misjudged another should suffer the same manner of death as that to which he has condemned the other. Lunette is joyous and glad of being reconciled with her mistress, and together they were more happy than any one ever was before. Without recognizing him, all present offered to him, who was their lord, their service so long as life should last. Even the lady, who possessed unknowingly his heart, begged him insistently to tarry there until his lion and he had quite recovered. And he replied, Lady, I shall not now tarry here until my lady removes from me her displeasure and anger. Then the end of all my labors will come. Indeed, she said, that grieves me. I think the lady cannot be very courteous who cherishes ill will against you. She ought not to close her door against so valorous a knight as you, unless he had done her some great wrong. Lady, he replies, however great the hardship be, I am pleased by whatever may be her will. But speak to me no more of that, for I shall say nothing of the cause or crime, except to those who are informed of it. Does anyone know it, then, besides you two? 
Yes, truly, lady. Well, tell us at least your name, fair sir. Then you will be free to go. Quite free, my lady? No, I shall not be free. I owe more than I can pay. Yet I ought not to conceal from you my name. You will never hear of the knight with the lion without hearing of me, for I wish to be known by that name. For God's sake, sire, what does that name mean? For we never saw you before, nor have we ever heard mention this name of yours. My lady, you may from that infer that my fame is not widespread. Then the lady says, Once more, if it did not oppose your will, I would pray you to tarry here. Really, my lady, I should not dare, until I knew certainly that I had regained my lady's good will. Well then, go in God's name, fair sir, and, if it be his will, may he convert your grief and sorrow into joy. Lady, says he, may God hear your prayer. Then he added softly under his breath, Lady, it is you who hold the key, and, though you know it not, you hold the casket in which my happiness is kept under lock. Then he goes away in great distress, and there is no one who recognizes him save Lunette, who accompanied him a long distance. Lunette alone keeps him company, and he begs her insistently never to reveal the name of her champion. Sire, she says, I will never do so. Then he further requested her that she should not forget him, and that she should keep a place for him in his mistress's heart, whenever the chance arose. She tells him to be at ease on that score, for she will never be forgetful, nor unfaithful, nor idle. Then he thanks her a thousand times, and he departs pensive and oppressed, because of his lion that he must needs carry, being unable to follow him on foot. He makes for him a litter of moss and ferns in his shield. When he has made a bed for him there, he lays him in it as gently as he can, and carries him thus stretched out full length on the inner side of his shield. Thus in his shield he bears him off, until he arrives before the gates of the mansion, strong and fair. Finding it closed, he called, and the porter opened it so promptly that he had no need to call but once. He reaches out to take his rein and greets him thus, Come in, fair sire, I offer you the dwelling of my lord, if it please you to dismount. I accept the offer gladly, he replies, for I stand in great need of it, and it is time to find a lodging. End of section 6